Book of Luke, I think it's awesome. You know, I think you really get a panoramic view of the scripture. Uh, Paul said, God forbid if I preach not the full gospel. So we're getting it all. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's give a hand for my wife. She's doing a wonderful job. Moving right along through the book of Luke. Amen. I hope you guys are reading, uh, reading through the book of Luke with me. Amen. 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 Well, this is a long chapter. This chapter has 71 verses in it. It's a long chapter. A lot has happened in this chapter. And so we are going to um, look at some of the things that uh, have happened in this chapter. I really don't believe that I will finish this chapter tonight, um, but that's okay. We will finish it. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, bow your heads with me, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, Father, we thank you and praise you tonight for an opportunity to gather together as your body of believers, Lord, your church, around uh, the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the book of Luke, for moving on Luke's heart uh, to write this book, Lord, write this letter. And, uh, Father, there is something you want us to get tonight. And I pray, Lord, that we will have ears to hear tonight what the Spirit of the Lord would say to us. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you allow me to be your mouthpiece tonight. I thank you for the anointing that rests upon me, Lord, to deliver your word. And Father, I pray that you will get the glory and the honor and the praise uh, from what goes on tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Verses. We are opening up with the plot to kill Jesus. The plot to kill Jesus. The nerve of them wanting to kill our Savior. Amen. But a plot to kill Jesus. The Son of Man's Last Supper. Uh, okay. The Son of Man's Last Supper, his traitor, instructions, and warning in the book of Luke 22. Uh, we're going to look at first the plot to kill Jesus. Then we're going to look at Jesus and his, there is an H missing, disciples prepare the Passover. And then Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And then the, the disciples argue um, about greatness. Okay. The disciples argue about greatness. So we're going to read uh, Luke 22, verse 1 through 6. I also have a clip uh, that I believe will go right along with the lesson tonight that I'm going to show at some point. And it reads, now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then, <clears throat> then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, <coughs> who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains captains how he might portray him to them and they were glad and agreed to give him money so he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the app in the absence of the multitude okay in the absence of the multitude there were uh, uh, there were three in cahoots uh, with the murder of Jesus, and we'll look at it. The plot to kill Jesus. Jesus Christ was seriously opposed by formidable foes. The religious, uh, the religionists rejected him, rejected him to keep from losing the favor, the security, and the position of the world. Satan opposed his work of salvation because men would give their lives and worship to God. Men rebelled against his demand for self-denial, for the commitment of all 
all one is and all one has for the cause of God. And so there was um, real opposition coming against Jesus. It was the religionists um, who should have been for him. And then there was Satan himself, and then there were also uh, men rebelling against his demands for self-denial. Okay. Okay. Now, this was a time of feasting and joyfulness. It was a, a festival uh, called the Passover. And uh, it was ironic that at a time when they should be celebrating how uh, Jesus, how God spared their life in the Exodus, okay, and the Passover happened when they put the blood over the doorposts. Uh, they were they were celebrating this time, but at the same time they're plotting to kill Jesus. So it's kind of ironic what's going on. The Passover. The Passover uh, is tied to the death of Jesus. This passage begins the final stages of Jesus' life before he was killed. In dramatic fashion, Luke sets the stage for what was coming. He mentions the Passover and then points out those who are plotting Jesus' death. Two scenes as a, opposite from one another as can be imagined. The Passover was a feast, a joyous and festive occasion. It was a feast when all of God's people were to be celebrating God's glorious deliverance of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. However, during the very days of this joyous celebration, Jesus' murder was being plotted. Tragically, it was being plotted by religionists. The very people who should have been taking the lead in the Passover. On the one hand is the celebration of deliverance, the saving of life, and on the other hand is the plotting of death, the taking of life. This passage deliberately sets the stage for what was to come. Matthew 26, 7 says, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. I want to share with you about the feast uh, that they were in, uh, the Feast of Unleavened um, Bread. It's, written, it's spoken of in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, 5 through 8, and then Luke 22, 1. Luke 22, 1. But I want to uh, uh, just mention about the feast that they were in. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. This feast is another name for the Passover feast. However, on the first day of the Passover week, the Feast of Unleavened Bread had special significance. It was the day that all preparations were made to celebrate the Passover. Okay? Preparations included securing the lamb and taking it to the temple to be sacrificed. Preparation also included securing the items of food and drink necessary for the Passover and arranging the room for the feast. However, there were two preparations from which the Feast of Unleavened Bread received its name. Okay. And number one, I think I put this in here. There was the baking of unleavened bread. On the night of the Passover, God had told Israel to make final preparation for being delivered from Egypt, Egyptian bondage. However, the Israelites did not have time to bake leavened bread. And many of you all know that yeast has to rise in the time that it takes, okay? They did not have that time. And so that's where the whole unleavened bread came in. They had to bake bread without leaven because of the time it takes 
for unleavened bread to rise. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is simply one of the Passover ceremonies of which Israel remembers God's glorious deliverance for their forefathers from Egypt, Egyptian bondage. And so Jesus is here in Jerusalem with his disciples, okay, celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Passover. Okay. The second significant of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was there was a ceremony by which all leaven within the house had to be removed. Okay. It must be uh, remembered that leaven was a symbol of evil to the Jews. In removing all leaven, they were picturing the need for putting evil out of their lives and households. So there was an actual search made throughout the rooms of the house. The people looked for any crumbs of leaven that might have fallen upon the floor under or between some furniture. Whatever leaven was found, no matter how small a crumb, it was removed from the house. By removing all leaven from their households, the Jews were saying they wanted to be included among the faithful for their forefathers, of their forefathers. They wanted to be counted as the, the faithful who purified and cleansed their lives and households for the journey of deliverance from bondage and slavery. So here uh, in the Old Testament, they actually did this. And here in the, uh, the New Testament, uh, they are celebrating this and going through um, the rituals uh, uh, to symbolize what their forefathers actually came through. Amen? Yes. All right. Um, On the 14th day of the first month of twilight, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So they had to do this seven days. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy conse uh, uh, convocation, and you shall do no customary work on it. Sounds like I read that twice. Okay. All right, this particular uh, passage of scripture also talks about the opponents of Jesus, um, and they were the unbelieving religionists. Okay, Luke paints a dramatic picture, as I told you that, while the people were in the streets, openly preparing to praise God for his delivering power and the saving of life, the religionists were behind closed doors, plotting to murder the very one who had come to be their great deliverer. I want you to note uh, uh, two things. Uh, the religionists uh, plotted to use deception and lies to trap Jesus. They had to do that uh, because everything that Jesus did uh, was of truth, you know, and was exactly what the Father had told him to do. So in order for them to trip him up or to trap him in any way, they had to be deceptive and they had to lie. But can you imagine the religious people who were supposed to be the examples of that day of what it means to serve God, you know, involved in deception and lies to trap Jesus, okay? Um, Matthew's 26, uh, four said, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. And Mark 14, 1 says, after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how, sought how, they, uh, sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. Okay. 
the opponents of Jesus were unbelieving religionists. The second, the reason they sought to get rid of Jesus was because they feared the people. This means that they feared both losing the support of the people and the reaction of the people against them if the people knew they were, uh, uh, they were trying to kill Jesus. Okay. Uh, there is something else I want to read to you about that. And at any point, you have anything to say or any remark, you can come up to the mic. Okay, there's something I wanted to share with you, but I will wait until I find it. Okay, the second opponent of Jesus was Satan. Okay, you have the religious leaders coming against him. And then second, you have Satan himself. Satan is the spiritual being who is out uh, to destroy the relationship between God and men. In wrath and bitter hostility, he opposes God. Satan is seen entering Judas, stirring him to strike up a bargain to betray Jesus. Later, Satan will enter Judas again and urge him to go ahead and finish his work of betrayal. The point is, if Satan could destroy Jesus, keep him from fulfilling his work on earth, then man could never be saved. But how many know Satan played right into the hands of God, okay? Satan, of course, had no idea that God was going to save the world through the death of Jesus. And uh, I thought about that, and I was just thinking about the wisdom of our God, you know? And he already anticipated what Satan would probably try to figure out, you know? He wanted to know when Jesus was being born. He knew God was going to do something about man. He understood how much God loves man. So he, he knew a savior was coming. Uh, it had been prophesied, you know, and he had watched through, through the porticles of time and he knew a savior was coming, but he did not know because he is not all knowing, you know, like our God. He is not uh, God's counterpart. He is a created being that was created by God. Uh, who uh, is foolish enough to raise up against God and think he can challenge and handle our God. Amen? But here he is, you know, um, working through Judas. Uh, Satan is not om omniscience. He could not know the future any more than anyone else. Therefore, he had attempted to have Jesus killed time and time again, even as a child. Satan's opposition to God and man is clearly seen in Scripture. Okay. I want you to note the handout that I gave you. Okay. And this is what Satan is all about. Okay. He hates God and he hates us. Uh, but these are the things you will find him doing. He tempts to disobey God. He tempts uh, man to disobey God. He snatches the word out of man's heart. He plants unbelievers in the midst of believers, the church. Okay. He afflicts people with sickness and disease. He tries to sift, shape men in their faith. He causes murder and killing. He lies and is the father of lies. He enters men's lives. He plants evil into the hearts of men. He leads men to steal from God. He tempts married couples sexually. He tries to keep people from forgiving uh, others or forgiving each other. He blinds the minds of unbelievers lest they believe. He deceives, he, he deceives the minds of men. He transforms himself into a messenger of light to deceive man. He transforms some ministers into ministers of righteousness to deceive men. 
and he works in the disobedient. He launches powerful strategies against believers, and he rules the principalities, the powers, the darkness, the spiritual wickedness of this world, and he hinders the work of believers. Anybody ever sensed Satan's presence? Amen. He works with power and signs and lying wonders, and he leads men to blaspheme. And so this is uh, the work uh, of Satan. And I just thought I'd copy that and give it to you because uh, he's always trying to do something in our lives to get us to go against God or to be hindered or to be stopped, you know, to get discouraged and uh, turn around and just get out of the will of God. That's what he wants. Right? Get discouraged, you know, begin to call God a liar and begin to act like God is not faithful in what he has promised. Whatever he can do, you know, um, he will do to try to get us off our mark and out of the perfect will of God, our blessed place. Amen? Amen. Um, so he is an opponent. So Jesus had to contend with the religious uh, leaders. And then uh, Satan himself. And then um, the third opponent to Jesus was the covetous man named Judas. Okay, The covetous man named Judas. The third opponent to Jesus was a covetous man. A man who went his own way in life. Judas was such a man. Several facts show this. Judas was a, uh, was a professing disciple. In fact, he was one of the twelve. Just think about the fact Judas had been personally chosen by Jesus. All of us are personally chosen by the Lord. Judas had some great potential, some unique qualities that attracted the Lord, and the Lord gave Judas the most honored opportunity in all the world to develop his abilities the privilege of walking with him personally but all of us have that privilege too amen <coughs> but judas knew jesus face to face judas walked with jesus day after day judas heard most if not all that jesus taught and judas saw most if not all that jesus did miraculous uh, miracles and wonders. Judas was trained to be an apostle by Jesus himself, and Judas served as an apostle even on witnessing tours under Jesus' personal command. Jud Judas was warned of sin's consequences by Jesus himself. Despite all this, Judas's life was a terrible tragedy because he turned his back on the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas must not have truly believed that Jesus was God's son, the Messiah. He was a follower of Jesus. He was even one of the first 12 apostles, but he was not a genuine believer who entrusted his life to Jesus. He allowed something else to take his heart away from the Lord. Perhaps it was um, his craving for more and more, uh, to, uh, for more and more that blinded him to the truth about Jesus, that he was truly the Son of God who demanded loyalty. Maybe he became offended with Jesus about something. Or things did not go like he thought they should go. Most of the disciples were expecting Jesus, and we talked about this before. They were expecting Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom. And they were looking to have position, you know, and um, prosperity. They were looking for this kingdom to be set up. But maybe Judas's heart was so in, you know, what he could get. I believe he had um, he had a real uh, uh, lust uh, for for money, 
for wealth. You know, because we find uh, he, him stealing, uh, stealing and putting his hand in the, in the offering and, and different things like that. But Judas uh, had some real interesting things going on with him, yet he had such a great opportunity. I was thinking about this, and, I, and I'm sure you do this too when you're reading the word. Uh, it's not necessarily the word, but you imagine what went on, you know. And I thought about it. You know how uh, Jesus chose Peter, James, and John? And he was always bringing those three up. Perhaps Judas said, you know, why didn't he make me one of the three? You know, <laughs> or whatever. You don't know what it was, but his heart wasn't right. His motivation for coming wasn't right. And that happens even today. You know, uh, we witness to people, uh, they come into the church, but their motivation uh, is not right. Their motivation is not uh, to serve the Lord and love God and desire his will for their lives. They have another ulterior motive, you know. And sometimes it is, you know, to prosper or to gain, uh, you know, something else. But uh, this is the case with Judas. And I deliberated, I'm deliberating on Judas because he is a man, you know, like you and I, you know, we're men and women, and we could fall into the same trap that Judas, Judas walked with Jesus, you know, I, you know, as close as any of them, but yet he struggled. Um, it is still happening today. People become shipwrecked in their faith because. What are some of the reasons why you think people become shipwrecked in their faith? They start out with God. It, they have all the appearance of, of really being in it, really loving God, uh, really wanting to live, you know, for the Lord. Uh, but then, you know, something happens and their heart is revealed, you know, or they just completely turn away and whatever. What are some of the reasons that happen? I'm asking you. Become stagnant. They don't grow in the Lord. They don't grow in the Lord. What keeps us from growing in the Lord? Two things. Uh, one, not developing a personal relationship. Okay, I want to get it on tape. So that, okay, all right. Not developing a personal relationship mm -hmm. and not rightly dividing the word, not studying the word, mm -hmm. not meditating on it day yes. and night. You know, Jesus, I mean, uh, uh, Judas was walking with the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was walking with the actual Word right there. But yet he didn't, he, he, he didn't realize or didn't accept the Word for what it was, you know. But today we have the Word, you know. And as uh, Brother Jeff said, uh, uh, we could uh, walk away uh, from the Lord and and turn our backs on Him because you know we're not growing in the things of God like we should. Yes, I think uh, one thing that uh, causes people to become shipwrecked is the desire for fame. Mm. You know, uh, God bless them. He start putting them in you know places where there are people who have uh, influence, or power, or money, and then they think that they have arrived, and this is what it is, and this is where it's at, and then they get shipwrecked in their faith because they take their eyes off of Jesus and put it on the fame, mm -hmm. on the celebrity. Okay. I think, uh, yes. I think uh, another reason for a lack of uh, spiritual growth is just not knowing that, that, that as believers, as born again uh, people of God, that we're in a race and, uh, to complete an assignment that God has given us. A lot of people just don't know, hey, wait a minute, we're not just kind of la-di-da, kind of dallying around down here where we were born for such a time as this. And, and not knowing that can, can hinder people from growing. Another reason I think why people don't grow spiritually is because they don't want to grow. Mm -hmm spiritually they, they've gone so far they, they they know that it's going to require some sacrifice they know it's going to require some dying to self 
they know it's going to require some giving up of some things. And some people I've seen, that's, they only go so far. And they, I, ain't, I ain't sweating for the Lord. I ain't, I ain't giving that up. I'm saved, I pay my tithes, I come to church, but I ain't going all out. I ain't pulling all the stops. I'm not being transformed completely. I'm only going to go so far. And then that's it. Don't ask me to do anything beyond that. And I think that's a real reason why people just spirit of sloth, laziness, carnality. I love my sin. I love my, and it's not serious sin. It's just stuff that you involved in that's not the stuff of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. When I thought about your question, I thought of the uh, parable that was given. Uh, and my answer is going to be geared towards that. Why? Number one, I'm thinking because they really never accepted him or believed in the first place mm -hmm. and his emotional experience. Second reason, uh, are you storing the ground where the cares of this world were more important, they were more in love with that. Third reason, um, uh, uh, stony ground, very shallow in their faith. You know? Yes, yes, yes. I was getting ready to uh, say the- Three more. Okay. So, um, I, I, I just wanted to um, add something to what Pastor Eric said and made me think of King, I think it was King Solomon in the Bible where I think he was given instructions to leave the foreign women alone. Mm -hmm. And yet he was the wisest king. No other king would ever be as wise as him, but the Bible says that his heart slowly turned from God mm -hmm. as a result of that. Yes. And it was completely turned from God mm -hmm. as a result of just not giving up yes. the one thing God told him yes. to give up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the devil is very, very slick, you know. He'll give you a little something and you go that way, go that way, you don't know that that could be the very death of your spiritual walk with the Lord. Yes. You have up in your, on your um, screen that Judas must not have truly believed. Mm -hmm. I would say one, people become shipwrecked in their faith because they're not fully persuaded. Mm -hmm. And and I'm guilty, I've been guilty of this, so I'm speaking from experience. When you're not fully persuaded, the word and staying in it is what persuades you mm. and convinces you as you begin to believe it and confess it and profess it. So you have to be fully persuaded. Yeah. And then the other thing in Hosea chapter four, verse six, we perish because of lack of knowledge. Mm. So our faith perishes if, if we don't spend time getting to know what the will of God is our faith can be diminished if we don't build it up. We have to build ourselves mm -hmm. on our most holy faith. So. Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. And what I was going to say is very similar to that. The person is not fully discipled mm -hmm. because I only know as much about God as I know about his word. Mm -hmm. I only believe as much as I believe the word about God. So if I don't know the word, I don't know God. Mm -hmm. If I don't believe the word, I don't believe God. Mm -hmm. So it's the discipling that I believe that is the crucial, the most crucial yeah. thing to That's any true. person who is saved. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when a person gets saved, um, the initial, they spring up, they're so excited, they, they go tell everybody, and they go back to their same old friends who drug them down in the first place mm -hmm. that they are not ready to minister to. They need to completely stay away from their old friends, stay with the saints and the saints only, mm -hmm. build up, and then two or three years later go back to the old friends, not right away. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, I guess I just think, um, this is my, this my opinion, what I think, you know, Talk about Judas must not have truly believed that Jesus was God, Son of the Messiah. You know, I kind of believe that he, he did, you know. I believe, because you can even see it once this whole thing fell apart, he went and hung himself. I obviously knew he did something. He didn't know something. All of a sudden he realized he was the Messiah, you know. I, I believe that what, what Judas did, I believe Judas uh, miscalculated his sin. He might maybe thought that, that Jesus was going to get out of it the many ways he'd gotten out of other situations where they were going to kill him. He, he doubted, I feel it, I believe he kind of doubted the sin, 
they get at this, you know, Jesus get out of it. I'm gonna get my money, I'm gonna get what I want. <laughs> he dabbled in that sin, and then we realize that this, this is much more serious than what he thought. The sin has got him, and he realized it, and then it, it just crushed him. So as far as people become a shipwreck, I think that in many cases they might, they, they tend to dabble in things that they, they, they try, think they can calculate the sin in which they get into, which ultimately destroys them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Um, right. Let me let you say what you want to say, Chris. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to co-sign with what Sister Kim said. We're pretty much like people, especially like people my age, where they pretty much they lose their faith, get shipwrecked, and all of that because they just hang around wrong, hanging hang around the wrong people, and all that. Like when I first got saved, and all, I was like, what? Still, in, I was like somewhere in my high, on my senior year of high school, and like. I was still hanging around with the same people. Like I was still coming here like every Sunday and all of that. But I was still doing certain things I should have been doing anyways. And then it wasn't until like I got into college away from certain people and started hanging out with started coming on Wednesday nights and hanging out with uh more uh people God, young people my age, it helped me grow more and more. So it's like when people like even my age, like when I talk to people at school and they talk about yeah, I'm saved, but at the same time it's like I'm not it's like they not hanging around with the same people. Uh, the right people and all that because they fall, they fall, they fallen off and all of that. Like, mm -hmm. like they could have been going, like they, like before they came to college, they could have been going to church every single Sunday and, yes. and all of that because they parents. But when they they don't find the church and all this, so it's like they fall off. They meet the wrong people, send them, send them the wrong ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lifestyle. It really is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of you, well. Everything you said really was um, pretty right on. But the thing that I see uh, with, with Judas is uh, the devil had something in him. You know, he had a lust for, I guess, things or money or whatever. He wanted to get rich. He wanted the, the prestige, the money or whatever. And that's what, and that's what he was looking for. And so I believe way that that blinded him where he couldn't see clearly uh, who Jesus was. And he couldn't see even the miracles and all, you know, that was going on. I mean, he went out on those evangelistic campaigns and all of that. He was right there. What in the world was going on? I believe sin blinds. You know, sin deceives us. Sin tricks us. So we'll play with and dabble in a little thing, you know, even if it's getting on the internet, you know, watching something that you should not be watching. And you think that that's a simple thing. What you have done is given the devil something to use, yeah. you know, against you. Something to defeat you with, you know. And I think about Jesus and his temptation. Brother Johnny, I see you. I'm going to let you uh, say what you have to say. Jesus in his temptation, I remember Jesus saying, the devil has nothing in me. In other words, there is no open door. There is nothing that he can use against me. You know, there is no secret sin. There is no uh, inordinate craving in me. I delight to do thy will, O oh God. You know, he was, you know, fully persuaded, as many of you said, you know, and he was about the Father's business. And he did not let sin enter into his life, you know. The other disciples, they were not perfect, but uh, the thing about Judas is he had sin in his life. And I believe he blinded him. Yes, Brother John. Um. You know, I, I'm in agreement with what everybody else uh, said, but I also see a, a, a kind of, of a thread that runs through even uh, people today, is that their, their vision is very short term. Uh, they see today and dismiss what tomorrow brings. Um, and I, I see many young men today that they, they're blinded by the glitter and the glitz of what's right now. They may even be saved, might even, you know, have acknowledged the fact that, you know, there's an eternity in Christ. But they're blinded by that, as many of you said, many of us have said. And they fail to, to, to look beyond what today brings. 
um, many situations I see where guys say, well, I, I thought it looked so good, I just couldn't help myself. And, and not thinking and about the cost, the, cost, the consequences for the up the road. And so, you know, it's a human frailty that Satan finds that he can really work with. And he works with it really well. And we have to be convinced in our mind that despite what we see right now, that something better is ahead of that. Yes. You know? yes, yes. And I believe that's why God talks so much in the word about our enemy. He wants us to be aware of his tricks and his tactics that we're not carried away the same way. You know, he doesn't come with anything new. He does the same thing with us that he did, you know, from the very beginning, you know. Keep on, you know, uh, he'll give you a, a picture of something, you know, uh, that you desire, you know. He'll keep on at you until he finds out what it is, what's your weakness, and he'll go after that. You know, but many of us play and flirt with the devil, but I really like what Brother Johnny said. He's right, you know, the consequences, you know. I remember uh, one time, uh, an area in my life, it was an area of weakness, it was an area of sin. You got to call sin, sin, okay? It was an area of sin. And there came a point in my life where I looked at how I would feel tomorrow and next week and down the road. And I said, it is not worth it. And it was that thing that caused that door to be shut and not opened in my life. And it was the very thing that the devil would have loved to have strung me along with. Yes. Um, this basically goes in line with every, everything everybody else said. I think um, a lot of times we waver from lack of understanding of what the enemy is after. When, to say money, for example, the devil can't spend your money. He's not after your money. He's after the peace in your home. Mm -hmm. Or you just think about how you feel, and then that'll give you an idea of what he's after. So if he's after your joy, he's going to cause you to be angry. Mm -hmm. If he's after, yeah. you know, he's going to cause you, you know, if he's after your peace, he's going to cause you to be angry. Um, uh, it's just a, it's a couple things, but you, we have to understand what it is that he's after in order to know how to fight him. Mm -hmm. I was listening to the radio and this guy was talking about how he had to, he was trying to plug up his iPhone and he was losing power and he tried to plug it up in his MacBook. He just called it his book. Mm -hmm. But he realized he wasn't getting power in it. And what he did was he had to open the book up. He says, wow, I just realized I don't get power unless I open up the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's something like that. So that's the only way and every time the devil, every time the Lord prepared to fight the devil, he used his word. And that's what we have to do. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. And we've got to take it serious. We can't, you know, see these things as light, little, uh, insignificant things. That little, that little uh, lust or thing that the devil is trying to get your attention with, you know, the end thereof is destruction. You know, he comes to steal. He doesn't come to play with us, you know, or to give us a little bit of discomfort. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. You know, that's what his MO is. That's what he's all about. And so we've got to get smarter than that, you know. And that's why I, I thought, let's look at Judas, because he is not, um, you know, he is not much different than any one of us. There was something you know, that, that, you know, he was going after. His eyes could not have been on what Jesus was talking about, you know. He was, he was focused on something else. And because of that, when the devil was looking for someone to come into, Judas was it, and he could easily get in. You know? Yes. I heard a preacher say that uh, the devil doesn't want to kill all of us that many of us, he wants us to stay alive because he can do more damage mm -hmm. if we're alive than if he kill us. Mm -hmm. So he don't want to destroy all of us with the mm -hmm. body, but some of us, he wants to live because we can be very influential toward what he wants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, he wanted to kill me, I know that. <laughs> yes. I have a question. You just made this, the statement that um, we're like Judas. How'd you no, say that? Again? I, I didn't, I'm, I'm not saying. Judas is a man, was a man like us. I mean, mm -hmm. we are all, we're human like Judas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. Judas was human. Because I, right. I was about to say, um, Judas, it was kind of like destined that Judas was going to betray Jesus. And, you know, I've often wondered, is there any way Judas could have got out of that? You know what I'm saying? Because it was kind of prophesied right. that someone was going to betray him. Right. So it had to be one of the twelve. Right. You know. Did it have to be one? Well, maybe, maybe it did. Maybe, maybe they been, said. Maybe he had a lot of disciples, so yeah. it could have been... It didn't right. have to be one of the twelve. Right. So I he believe, kind of opened the door. Right. I believe over and over again, I believe Jesus strived with Judas over and over again, even when he knew Judas was putting his hand in the money basket. You know, he did not cut Judas down right away. Even when he was sitting at that table and he said, one of you are going to betray me and you're sitting here right now. I believe he was trying to give Judas an opportunity to repent. You know, I don't believe Judas had to go that way. You know, I don't, I don't believe that, um, you know, that, you know, we're, uh, you know, some of us are destined for hell, you know, and others of us are destined for heaven. I believe we make a choice in it. And because of that, we're destined for hell or we're destined for heaven. But I don't believe God has chosen, chose Judas to go to hell. You know, I believe Jesus chose Judas to be one of his disciples, but, you know, it was revealed to him, you know, what the nature, you know, of, and I'm not, I don't believe that he knew it was Judas right away. I don't even think he was thinking like that. It was something about Judas that he said, come follow me. He wanted Judas, yes. Well, he called Judas a devil. Right, but not from the very not in the very beginning. Um, right, he called him a devil at the table, but you know when you and that's when the devil, when Satan had come into him. Right, right, but I mean Jesus, Jesus saw Judas. Jesus, oh, well, I'm just convinced that Jesus knew. You know, this is me personally, you guys. <laughs> that Jesus knew. Judas was going to do that. And you know, when you study it, you know, they said somebody had to be close to Jesus to betray him. They couldn't, be, they couldn't just go and tell him during the middle of the day, here's Jesus, come and get him, because too many people liked him. Too many people loved him. So it had to be somebody who knew where he was going to be and all of that. So it was probably, well, I don't believe it was intended for one of the 12 to do it. It just so happened to be Judas. I mean, but Jesus, Judas was just no good from the beginning. He just, he, you know, from the beginning he was stealing and he didn't have a heart. He just didn't have a heart for Jesus. And it just kept following him. You could just see it. It just, he did not have a heart for Jesus. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I believe, I believe that his heart wasn't right. I do believe that. I believe his heart wasn't right. I believe Jesus, but I believe they all were attracted to Jesus for some reason. And they all were saying, could this be the Messiah in the very beginning? They were all kind of like that. But Jesus, I mean, uh, Judas went deeper. And I do believe it had to be because his heart wasn't right. He, he didn't get converted. You know? yeah, just real quickly, I agree with you. I don't think that Judas was destined to, to go to hell. I believe it was prophesied because God knows the nature of man. And that whenever you have any number of gathering of men, it's, it's, it was going to happen that one of them were going to betray him. Just like this church or any other congregation. You know, when you get a gathering of people, there's going to be somebody the enemy uses in that camp. But I don't think he just predestined that you just go to hell. Because like you said, he gave them a lot of opportunities to repent. And, I'm going to sit down, but... That was the reason why I brought it up because I really kind of wanted us to hear that we're not predestined for hell. 
you know, and I know a lot of people look at Judas and, you know, say, well, he was destined to go to hell. That's why I kind of threw that and asked you about it, because I really wanted us to hear that, you know, because some people might think, well, I've done too much now, and I'm just destined for hell like Judas was, and there's always grace, and there's always mercy at the feet of Jesus, yeah. and that's why. Yeah. And he could have repented <laughs> at any point. God gives us uh, an opportunity to repent, you know, but it's hard, you know. And But then when he went out and killed himself, you know, you know, it was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, God, what have I done? Amen. I agree with you that that God knows the end before the beginning, and He knew Judas's heart. God knew, and that's why it, it could happen that way. I think about Saul when he became king. I would not have wanted to be king because when he, uh, Samson said how the king would be, he said the kings will teach you kids. I mean Samuel. Kid, the king's going to take your kids, the king's going to take your daughters and have them doing this. The king, he gave all that story. He told all that ugliness. And Saul became the king, but God knew his heart. And so that's that's why I think, he, you know, Jesus just knows, he knew everything because of his communication with God. And that's why I said it was just going to be um, Judas because he knew it, because I knew his heart. At the, you know, again, he knows the end for the beginning. Yeah, he, he does, he does. But Judas could have repented, I believe, at any point. He could have repented, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I look at Judas, okay. Are these things I've said already? No. Okay. Where are we? <laughs> then he said to them all, if anyone des desires to come after me, oh, these are the scriptures here I wanted to share. Okay, Luke 9, 23, 24. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And uh, Judas heard Jesus say this, at least he should have if he was listening. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake will save it, you know. So Jesus didn't make any beans about the fact that it was going to cost them something to follow him. But I believe Judas wasn't willing to pay the price. Um, and then he says, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and he's saying more than one person, and who would betray him. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. And I know that that had to hurt Jesus deeply. Judas, I believe, coveted the world and its money. Judas filled his heart with the lust for more and more instead of filling it with Jesus. Jesus uh, Judas apparently followed Jesus out of a heart of greed and worldly ambition, not out of a heart of love and faith in him as the son of God. Judas made a covenant with the world. He promised and sought opportunity to betray him. Judas not only, Judas not only rejected, but sought to destroy Jesus. Many rejected Christ, but not all seek to harm and destroy him. And I thought that was really, that's really something. Amen. I was going to show you guys a clip, but I don't have enough time. Okay, yes, and Just an observation I made that um, Judas didn't 
I feel like if he was a grown man, he had to know he had a, a money problem, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so it's just strange <laughs> that he would, like, you know, let me be the treasurer. I just yeah. think that he kind of set himself up for failure. You know, uh, he had to have known that money was a weakness of his from the get-go. So. Um, thank you. <laughs> I like the way he said that. <laughs> ah, yeah, he had a weakness there. You know, it's, 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 it's interesting, you know, but we will, you know, many, many will go towards their weakness, you know, because they have a weakness and, you know, they, you know, they want to do what they want to do, okay? Well, I don't think we should go into the next section. We only got through the first six verses, is that right? Okay. How long is the film? Uh, the film was 10 minutes. Okay, the film was 10 minutes. Save we'll save it for next time. Okay. The next part is the Lord's Supper. Okay. The next part we're going to look at the Lord's Supper. Uh, Luke 22, 7 through 23. And uh, we're going to look at the great purpose of the Lord's Supper, the great significance of the Lord's Supper, the great meaning of the Lord's Supper, and the great appeal of the Lord's Supper, you know, so it's going to uh, really speak to us about that. Um, one of the things, if you go and read this, read this again, read uh, Luke 22, and take note of um, how Jesus was so uh, diligent to prepare for this last supper with his disciples. Uh, very strategic, you know, he... He made preparation. Again, we see him just like with the donkey. He had need of the donkey. He said, go and tell them. Uh, he had need of a place to have this supper with his disciples. And he said, go, you know, and you will find a place and it will be set up like this. You know, he made great preparation for this supper, this last supper uh, with his disciples. And it has great significance And what we do in taking communion has great significance, you know. And sometimes, you know, uh, we have to be reminded of that because um, we forget or we get enroped, you know. We just do it haphazardly. But as we look at this, uh, as we look at this section, we'll see that um, it has great significance, communion, the communion table and how Jesus honored uh, this uh, Passover with them, this supper that he was having with them, and the significance. So we're going to look at it. Um, and so go back and read it, uh, and look at it a little bit more closely, and then we're going to bring out some things in it. Amen? Amen. All right, well, that's where we're going to stop tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. And... Uh, you know, I think about, God, what is it, you know, that you would have us take uh, from here tonight? And, um, and I think the Lord would, would want us to be mindful of our enemy, you know. He is relentless. He is relentless. And I know some of us are challenged even now. Some of us are tempted, you know, are going through some real temptations, are struggling in some areas. God wants you to get the victory. He wants you to get the victory. And the victory is uh, the victory is is through fellowship with him and, and totally committing your life. You know, it's very important that you confess your sins first and foremost. Then the Bible says he is willing to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That cleansing part is very important because if you have any residuals of that, you know, you're more likely to go back into that, you know. But he can cleanse you of that thing, wash you clean, you know. And then you get in the word and feed your spirit and you'll be more likely to walk free. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. If you're here today and you need prayer, you want to, you need prayer, you need us to touch and agree with you about anything. If you, um, 
If you're struggling in some areas in your life or in a area in your life, God doesn't want you to leave here uh, without.